episode of The Prestige, a podcast about films, filmmaking and film theory. In each programme we'll focus on a particular movie and let a theme develop out from a review slash discussion of that film and see where it takes us. As always, we'll end our show on recommendations based on this week's choice and the theories and the ideas presented from it. But as always, we'll start by introducing ourselves. The more confident voice you're hearing is Rob Maythorn. Um, who I've known for many years, and for several of those, spent time in the film industry after completing a film degree at university. So he knows lots about the nuts and bolts of the films we talk about. Um, and also, more recently, he's been involved in other creative projects, uh, pho- photography, editing, publishing, you name it, he's, he's doing it right now. I try. My name's Sam Knowles, and I teach and I write about films and comic books and books and other things that interest I'm generally I'm just interested in stuff and I try and share that with other people as much as possible better to be those really isn't it so this week we were looking at the 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 film Dear Wendy Dear Wendy 2004 film from Thomas Vintenberg and Lars von Trier who are infamously of of the Dogma 95 tradition uh, we'll touch on some more of that later. Don't worry if you don't know what it is. We will come to that in time. Dear Wendy tells the story of a small American South mining town and a group of outcasts within it who form a bizarre gun club, essentially, mm. based around sort of faux Victoriana Edwardian ideals of being a dandy, being a gentleman. And the big thing for them is they are pacifists with guns, that they, they own these guns but they never brandish them. They aren't for... For fighting or killing, they are a symbol of their confidence. So it feels with with, with main character, it kind of builds up uh, their confidence. They become more out there, more kind of in themselves, and more 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 confident. But the inclusion of a sort of a rogue element into that group, as well as sort of heightened tensions within the town, kind of leads the the story and the club, the dandies, towards a a violent conclusion. It's very, I would say, affected in that if anyone's seen any of Lars von Trier's films, he tends to play with the idea of what a film is and what a narrative film is. And this film, while certainly more accessible than other films he's made, like Dogville, is still very much on a stage. You get very much the feeling of a stage and of a slightly affected narrative style. But that is also echoed in the slightly affected method of the main actors and the main characters uh, with their Edwardian dress and their over-the-top rituals and involvements in, in their guns in that club. Anything to add to sort of the, the, the plot, Sam? I don't think so, no. I really like this film. And I really, I, I kind of wish, actually, we, we'd said right at the start of the podcast, if you haven't seen it, just don't listen to any of this. Go away and watch it first. Because one of the things I really liked about this film is the way that it was set up as a love story. And I went into this entirely cold and didn't look at any of any of the blurb and just went with the film and for the first um I'd say probably twenty, twenty five minutes of the film you'll you, you have no idea to whom Jamie Bell is addressing what sounds like a love letter. And I thought that was really effective and I really enjoyed that. Um and it was almost a shame when it was clear who who Wendy actually was and her to whom this film was addressed. Um, I thought there were some nice nice touches, particularly around the the idea of this being a, a very southern town um, with the Confederate flags all over the place and and Clarabelle's appearance, well, her her first her first appearance, the the first appearance of the black maid in this. Uh, film is is very self consciously in front of, not self consciously on her part, but self consciously on part of the director. I think right in front of a Confederate flag. I I liked the the fact that uh, when he's introduced, his gun is introduced as a real gun fairly early on, and 
Um, I suppose we, we've talked about the Chekhovian gun before, the Chekhov idea that if, the, if a gun appears on the wall, then it will necessarily be fired. Um, mm. And it felt like, well, was it, I wasn't quite sure, was this this Vinterberg heavily influenced by Von Trier or Von Trier heavily influenced by Vinterberg? Or what's, what's the setup between the two? Uh, Lars Von Trier is very much the architect of this kind of dog made Danish cinema movement. He wrote Dear Wendy um, and he kind of gave it to Vinterberg to direct. The just so while we're touching it for the rest of the film, Dog Me ninety five was a made it a manifesto put together by Lars von Trier and Vinterberg and a few other directors that stripped away all artifice from film. Basically, the idea was that they, you couldn't bring props to a set, you couldn't add sound afterwards. You should seek for natural performances from non actors. It was there was a whole set of um, manifesto, and I'll, I'll link them in the in the show notes. But their idea was to get back to a very raw sort of film. If you see a film like The Idiots, which was probably the most famous film from, from that movement, it's very raw. Right. And it is very in your face. And the director lets the actors kind of go run wild with their characters. It does feel with things like Dear Wendy and Dogville, which is the film that came before this, they've almost swung back the other way. And it's purposefully fake it did feel very staged not not necessarily a bad way because as i said i only enjoyed it but i knew throughout that i was watching a set of performances yes i think there's something very brechtian about this film in the kind of the way that you see you're well aware to play and this the the, uh, electric square where it's set is broken down consciously into sections Mm. with almost mythical names things like the swamp and east corner and shop side and that kind of thing mm. and it does feel weirdly self-contained the whole world in that kind of staged way there are stories of the big city and gangs but nothing ever happens outside of that kind of that square and the mine as a sort of separate world from it yes and the point of the film i suppose is that um as much as they talk about um gangs and violence outside and the the pressures of society it's all they, they all create it themselves and um, the the violence is is integral to the gang in a way that they're really trying to resist yes and that's where we sort of step into some of the the, the sort of the, the deeper meaning of the film it's very clearly a almost a scathing attack on american values mm. gun control the inherent violence in american society um, the NRA and all that sort of thing and there's a lot of some subtle allegory, some very heavy handed allegory in it but because of its Brechtian nature I think that it kind of works in the way that if they hadn't had that fake staging nature of the film, it would have felt really heavy handed but because as Sam says, you're aware throughout you're watching characters uh, it's almost kind of stock characters almost you know um, is it the old traditional kind of Renaissance plays mm. with that real kind of stock characters that you feel like you can be a, if you feel like the film can be a bit more preachy because we're all aware it's it's the bright light cinema. Yeah, I think that just for those who have watched it, I mean, from personally for me, I really enjoyed some of the allegory stuff because I didn't quite know what he was saying at all times. That was something actually. I have a, a note here. I wrote quite extensive. A peek behind the curtain of the the incredible professionalism of this podcast. My notes are normally nicely ordered, and I know roughly speaking which uh, which things fit together. But uh, I wrote these notes down fairly um, higgledy piggledy as I watched the film quite recently this evening. So I have no idea where anything is, but I have got a note um, in the middle of middle of all this. That says thirty minutes in, I have no idea where this is going. Yes. I I was so like and and I I really enjoyed that I enjoyed thinking well I've got no idea what's being said where this narrative is going but who cares about that Yeah I mean from my point of view with uh, I've seen it twice now I watched it once when it first came out um, and I really enjoyed it and I thought this way added it on this week but the allegory is kind of very almost anti-American and you get the vibe that the the dandies this gun club are meant to portray America with their 
hopeless optimism that they can be pacifists with guns mm. and they can ensure the safety around the world and all that sort of thing. But the inherent nature of guns means that they can't. Yeah. I did write, write the word deluded a lot. Yes. But to take that uh, that, that uh, sort of metaphor to an extent, I have no idea who they're trying to say the police are. Mm. I have no, no idea who they're trying to say Sebastian is. Sebastian is the the grandson of the maid mm. who who's almost his appearance in the dandies is the catalyst that kicks off the finale of the film i suppose uh, but one one word one thing that came to my mind when watching this film is the quote from the poem that's on the Statue of liberty which is give me your poor your tired your huddled masses yearning to breathe free and it's noticeable that the the gun club the dandies are formed from the lame the poor the outcasts mm. and the idea America always comes of it they are the outcasts from other countries come together as America to build something new and something better yes and it feels very much like Vinterberg and Hans Fierger are saying that that's a brilliant ideal but you have to deal with the real world yeah and the the idea that the, the, the miners and that real world are are always there and it's ever present sort of you know, there's a big thing in the film that the the wheel of the mind is always turning. Mm. And that to me really echoed the idea that in their view this real world is always there. America can go off and do their own thing and, you know, as a seed from all their different sort of previous uh, conquerors. But the real world is still there and you can't just change how the real world is. Not only is the uh, the wheel always there and always turning, but there's always something slightly wrong with it. Mm. There's, 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 he makes a, a point of saying at the beginning that it creaks and there's something slightly wrong. So there's a reminder throughout that noth- nothing's right, nothing's perfect about about life and therefore about this this club that they've got. There's a sense that something is going to go wrong. Um, and you get something, well, I, I suppose from the very beginning with the, with his voiceover and J.B. Bell says... I'm, I can't see the square now. Um, I'm separated from you, um, and th- there is there is a distancing and right from the start that means you know something wrong. Something is going mm. to go wrong, uh, but that's something you get with with the with the wheel right at the beginning. Yeah, I think that I think that there is a, a sense of unease that runs through the film, and I think it's noticeable that uh, that Vindenberg casts kids basically in all these roles. Mm. That as as an audience, you do feel you, there's a little bit of kids, um, and the idea that America somehow is this, this this childlike nation, their actions, which in their mind are fine, everyone else can kind of see just trouble brewing and building through the entire. Building. There is a, a, a sense of dread, even in the sort of the happy days of of the dandies when everything can be going okay. There's the film very much works on that you feel, you feel it's building and building and building towards. The ending. Yeah, it's Susan's little poem that ends, it all ends well, and you know it's not all, all going to end well. Yeah. I think that, like, one of the sort of the strange things for me as an audience, and I, I, I hope maybe you have some answers on this for me, Sam, but from the director's point of view, despite kind of lambasting gun, gun culture and kind of skewering the idea of the, the fetishization of guns through that film, the end of the film, the the, the Spoilers of everyone that the shootout at the end felt very fetishizing of the film with guns. Mm. That he doesn't really know what he's saying about the, about the guns as as a as a film director because the shootout is very. They all get their moment. All the guns perform mm-hmm. as they hoped. I mean, it all ends obviously quite badly. Everyone involved, um, but it is quite a sort of traditional action mm. gun culture kind of film. Yeah, in that end scene. it's interesting how he, like you said, he seems to want to be very angry about this American Americana, this fetishized fetish. I can't say that word. Make, making a fetish or something. Let's pretend I said the word. It, but yeah, like you said, there's there's no there is a lot of that in the final scene, and a, a big thing is made of the performance of the gun. Mm. I was I was thinking about the um, the the moment of non-firing um, 
right at the beginning that Stevie talks about this this World yes. War Two gun that hasn't fired, and that's that's why its its owner is is left to die. Um, and he's Stevie's quite proud of that. Um, and there's something that happens right at the end um, that. In the same way, there's a fetishization of this moment in which the gun fails to perform. So mm. in in everything, there's there's the, there's an element of performance, an element of last one tree. You feel the 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 writer or the or the, the director is sitting back and thinking, yeah, we we've made a, a really good performance piece out of this. I think there's a that touch on there's a lot of sort of foreshadowing in the film. Mm. As Sam said, we talk a lot about Chekhov's gun, and here it is a literal gun. But everything in the build-up comes to a head in the end. Everything from all the different ways in which they shoot, um, all the different ways in which they interact with each other and their own guns, and each one of them kind of gets a a story arc that is redemptive and celebratory, despite it obviously ending in in most of their deaths. Hmm. And there's a Bonnie and Clyde element to a lot of their actions that we are supposed to view these people as the heroes. But at the same time, any any basic reading of the film pretty much shows that they aren't the heroes. They're the, the weird gun club in the in the basement. Mm. Um, and it is a, sort of a very interesting kind of dichotomy between there are heroes and especially with, uh, I mean, it's not Freddie, Huey, um, who is the uh, the crippled mm. character who has a, a wonderfully kind of redemptive final moment. Yes. Yeah, um, but at the same time, he's just shot someone in cold blood in the head. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a really weird, it really kind of plays with your expectations as to who the bad guys and good guys are, especially with the situation with the maid, mm. who ultimately isn't a very good character at all. Uh, that that moment that you're referring to, I just have one note, which is, oh, wow, underlined and in capsules. It's yes. just the most amazing moment in the film. Um, and I think that, I mean, the film didn't do great guns when it came out and didn't get great reviews, but I do think, looking back now, it, it's really, it really is quite a good film. Mm. Now, to, to kick it a bit wider um, into sort of general film world, for me, there are three... Of three things stuck out with him. I'll kind of pitch it to you to kind of run with if you want to. One of which is kind of film as opposed to Brechtian story. Um, the film, this is a film that knows the film. We know, we all know it's a, a constructed story. The other one uh, is always. The, it's noticeable that it's an anti-American film made by a non-American. Yes. So I think there is a, a a thread in European and world cinema that kind of plays on anti-Americanism. Right. That and linked to that is the ideals of. American cultural imperialism mm. that uh, we we the stories of the world are American stories these days particularly especially in, in Europe and that there's a, a, a pretty Hollywood which is very despite being quite a liberal place is very right wing in some of its filmmaking mm. dealer's choice sir <laughs> right okay well um I I had two things I was going to throw at you um uh well, one one of them was um, was phallic imagery. Um, let's talk about penises for a while. Um, Fair enough. And the, the other one was the music. I was going to get nerdy about music. Mm. Um, I thought you would. I thought you would. Yeah. So, but I will um, just for a moment talk about the um, you were talking about this this idea of the the right wing nature of Hollywood, which I think is is a really interesting one because. Um, you're right, and I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it because you hear so much about the Western media being liberal, mm. and then, and also the arts being liberal. I mean, and I'm, not, I don't have many many right wing friends, and I'd say a good percentage of my friends certainly, um, those within the arts community, within the education community, are definitely left wing. Um, so it's something I tend to I tend to think of as people being liberal people, but then you get this um, this epitome of the arts, the the centre of the arts in Hollywood is is very definitely not, and I hadn't really thought about that. And maybe this this film, this idea of the shootout you get in this film, and you get in other films as well, is is 
in some way Hollywood trying to come to terms with that maybe um, yeah m- that, maybe that. there's there's this element they 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 want to, the the liberalness wants to break free and yet it doesn't yet it get it gets shot down and maybe there's something about the 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 shootout in which inevitably there is a, there is a doomed element that connects with that I, I, I would agree I think that Hollywood particularly does suffer from this kind of dichotomy of show business and the business is an, is an integral part of that mm. Hollywood doesn't make art films it makes movies and especially in America if you look at any of the big we've discussed this we discussed this with Avengers uh, months back where everything is solved by hitting it hard or shooting it mm. and if you can look at the swathes of films coming out of Hollywood and the amount of them are solved by violence is is astronomical it, it is daunting the amount of films that Hollywood produced that are that kind of right-wing imperialistic colonial in many ways we go over there and we fix it I mean a great example recently uh, which I won't say is a great example it's a, a very bad film but a great example of this was American Sniper now I really hated American Sniper mm. when I saw it it made me really quite angry with the kind of the jingoism and the racism and the and the gung ho nature of that film, yeah, but that is. I remember talking to you because I, I never saw it, but I remember, I remember talking to you about it and resolving not to see it based on the fact that you disliked it so much. I really did, and it, it was just because it was so. It felt like a war propaganda piece. Mm. You know, I've, 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 I've have done a degree in film. You do study that kind of that kind of a birth of a nation sort of propaganda films and it felt like that you know no one from the other side of that that conflict gets a name or a character and he just counts at the map people he kills but that is that something I mean, it has been it isn't all bad it has been wonderfully skewed in things like um team america mm. which does wonderfully skew the idea of world police all being american yes but it, <laughs> even then a film like that is still solved by shooting everything and they can layer satire much they want to do it's still just it's still the same story of everything is solved by being shot mm. and i think there is a a tension in hollywood that you have some incredibly progressive films um and you have some pretty progressive people but you think about how progressive our our, our, our culture is these days but if you look at the um the films that come out all the relationships are straight relationships they all tend to have a, a gay best friend. There are no non-traditional romances shown on big screens, particularly. Mm. Um, and when they are, it's it's about that. So things like Brimit Mountain and Bound, where the story is about, oh, it's so different, it's so edgy, it's about a gay relationship. Whereas day-to-day life, that isn't the way it is anymore. And it, I think there's a, a deep well of right-wing output from America, from, from Hollywood. And I think that's from a British point of view, America as a whole does seem very right wing. Mm. Even their left wing parties are still a bit like we're a bit like that's a, that's a bit that's a bit right wing, guys. I was I was wondering, and this is a a whimsical question that I don't expect an answer to from anyone, and feel free to tell me to stop it. But I just wondered, it was some something that that came. I was just thinking when when you were talking there about the difference between. A film and a movie. Now it sounds like the awful picky pedanticness of an academic, and I'm sorry about that. But I was wondering whether this idea that um, movie is the American word. Traditionally, the British have made films, and the Americans have made movies, and now nowadays the two have sort of bled into one another. The two words. But I wonder whether um, there is a fundamental distinction there between um, a European tradition that makes films that are things that you watch and an American tradition that makes movies that are about action, about moving, about doing stuff, about moving pictures. I have a theory here. Go for it. Uh, it links back to a, a larger theory I have, is which is that not everything is art. Okay. There are in every every artistic tradition, from theatre to painting to sculpture to dance, there are things that are art and there are things that are entertainment. 
And neither is better or worse than the other, but they are different things. And I think the reason why they're different, it's all about who is being served. Now, in my theory, and I'm not saying that I, I am a, a critical um, thinker, anyway, art is about the artist being served. They are serving their vision, their story, their thoughts and their ideals onto paint, onto stage, onto screen or whatever. Mm. Entertainment is about serving the audience. In the same way, if you look at, let's take a very popular example, music. No one's looking at One Direction and saying they're artists. Well, be, people love that they're wrong. Yeah, <laughs> in that they are entertainers. Yeah. They, 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 they take you out, they show you a good time. It's all about the audience being served. Mm. And that isn't to denigrate entertainment versus art. I don't think, I, I'm, I stress very much that it isn't like art is better or entertainment is worse. But no one's thinking that they are artists. Mm. And in the same way, you have certain artists, some like Seagull Ross, let's say, is an example of that. Or Seagull Ross, I can't pronounce them. Who are very much musical artists. And yes, they've found great success doing it, but what they produce isn't about feeding their audience, it's about feeding themselves. Mm. And I think that the film movie line falls down on those same divides. Mm. That obviously things can cross that, but movies are built to serve an audience. That's where you get big summer movies. And you don't get art movies, you get art films. Mm. Yeah, and yeah. art films can have a great f success. Like, that, that isn't to say that isn't, you know, that isn't true. And entertainment films can completely bomb because they don't get the audience. Because yeah. they're too, too driven by one person's goal. And I think the things like Kubrick can cross those lines sometimes between the two but some of the cubic films that don't land are when everyone thinks it's a movie but it's really a film mm. and i'm well aware that we're forcing some of these terms through the, the filter we try to apply to them but i think there is an inherent difference in those two things yeah, interesting. um and that's my theory well i i think we should I think that that puts a nice nice little cap on our discussion we can uh, lovely people can write that down and refer to it later today Yes, or or find me and Twitter and tell me I'm wrong. Okay, good. Right, I I do enough telling Rob is wrong. Someone else should do it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, what have you got in the way of recommendations then? So, my recommendations. I have got two recommendations this week, as, as is our want. Mm -hmm. The first is a film from 2003, so the year before Dear Wendy, called Elephant. Elephant is from Gus Van Sant. And it is basically, it is the dramatised version of the Columbine High School Massacre. Right. It's not actually dramatised, it is a, it's set in a different school, and a different town, with different people, and all that kind of thing. But it is very much still an attack on American gun violence, attack on American gun culture and fetishization, but in a very different way to the way it did. When he does it, it's a very, it's a very, almost more dogmatic, very naturalistic, very long shots, with not a lot happening. But if in that case, same kind of, I suppose, creative zeitgeist at the time, which was a lot about school shootings, uh, which have died down of late, which is for the best. Yeah. This was the other one that came out at the same time. And I think it's an interesting companion and comparison to Dear Wendy. And they had to tackle the same, same subject matter and the same ideas around gun culture, but from a very different point of view. That's something we really didn't talk about, was that, about 10 years ago when this came out there was a horrible explosion in the the events that this is alluding to yes but and anyway let's not get back into that i'm just remembering things i should talk about it's uh, sorry um <laughs> and secondly the other film i'm going to recommend is a film called the host now, the host is a korean film um i don't know what year it's from it's from 2006 it's on 2013. You don't want the 2013 one. You want the 2006 one. Right. It's uh, from Korea. And it basically is a giant monster movie. But it's very much really a comment on American imperialism in Korea. And the idea that Americans come to their country and they plunder it for its natural resources. And they dump what they don't need in the, in the lake and end up with this giant monster. 
but it is it is smarter than the average giant monster film, shall we say? And it has this this undercurrent of commenting on cultural imperialism and the cultural sort of dominance of America. So those are my recommendations. And what's so wrong about the twenty thirteen one? It isn't a remake. It's a it's a film version of Stephanie Meyer's next book, and she wrote Twilight. Right. Okay. And we'll avoid that one. Entirely different story, but it has the same name, and it's oh, terrible. I like it when Rob goes first because he'll get the obscure ones out of the way, and then I can come up with obvious films. And my first one is, I suppose, not not really one film. It's watch any classic a western, and I'm thinking the two I've got written down are the original Three Ten to Yuba and Butch Cassidy. And I suppose of those of those two, the one I go for is Butch Cassidy because. Um, a, it uses music in, in, a, in a really interesting way, and that's something we didn't really get onto with with Dear Wendy, but um, one thing that recurs throughout Dear Wendy is the Battle Hymn of the Republic, um, mm-hmm. which is a very interesting piece of music because it was, it was used in the American War on both sides. Um, so it, it is a song for the southern forces and for the northern forces at the same time. And Butch Cassidy does does similar things with music, similar interesting things with music, um, and also has a final shootout against all odds scene, which I think mm. it plays interestingly into this, this idea of of the underdog who is not... Well, is an underdog, but isn't going to survive in the way that you might be expected the under, you might expect the underdog to survive. And my other one um, is a more recent film, I think the most recent film we've talked about, um, and is more of a stylistic nod to to Dear Wendy than necessarily a thematic one, is Son of Rambo from 2007, um, which has very interesting things to say about um, relationships between young people, um, also the, the... artistry behind a film um, and is another one that was a very different film than I thought it was going to be when it started out and Dear mm. Wendy starts out as a love film but it still is a love film but there are lots of other things going on and Son of Rambo is something something very different from what I thought it was going to be but then that would be my, my second recommendation. If you should want to get in touch with Rob personally on Twitter to, to shoot him down, then his address is... At Rob Kaiju. And Sam, you are... I am at Life Academic. And for more general retweets, favourites, etc., um, our centre account, which is manned by one or either of us, depending on who's got more free time, is at Prestige Podcast. Come tell us we're wrong. Yeah, but mainly him. So Sam, next week is your choice. Yes. What are we doing? I would like to give The Monuments Men a watch. Ah, I've never seen it, so it'll be a good chance to get that cut car. It's one of those ones that we, you've you've said it was um, one of those ones you were you always always meant to watch and never got around to it. And it was the same for me as well, actually. I, I quite wanted to see it this cinema and never did get the chance to. So it'd be good to get a chance to watch it now and have a chat about it. Lovely. Well, we shall see you guys next week. We'll see you on Twitter. Bye. Prestige is a Kaiju Industries production. Check out their other work at facebook.com forward slash Kaiju Industries. Rawr! Arg.